Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. All right, let's get this thing going. Um, I want to make sure that we got all the time that we need. Uh, if you could, you know, um, save your Q and A for the Q and A. So let Eric kind of go through this, so we can make sure that we get him back on the train because he's got to go back to to New York City tonight. So, but we'll take our time. We got plenty of time to do this. So, won't you please welcome right now from Columbia University, first time here at the Westport Astronomical Society, Eric Raymer. Um, I want to give credit to Dan, first of all, for um, doing a really great job of, of selling my talk on the website. <laughs> because when he emailed me initially, he said, well, what do you study? And I said, oh, supergiant fast x-ray transients. I gave oh, him this. Oh, yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> that. <laughs> Probably a little more technical description than I should have, but he pulled all the interesting stuff out and, and threw it up there. So if you're here because of that, it's, it's because of him, not me. Uh, I forget sometimes that I'm not talking to other astro people. But a, another title for this, if you're not familiar with supergiant fast x-ray transients, uh, is really just the and feeding of dead stars uh, because that's what these systems are doing. Um, I hope by the end of the talk you think supergiant fast x-ray transient is equally interesting. Um, but just to give you a quick overview of what I'll, what I'll talk about today, I want to start with some very broad ideas in x-ray astronomy because these systems are observing, um, or these systems are what we're observing, we observe in the x-ray band. Sorry? Do you want lights on off? Um, what do you think? Keep some of the lights on so we can get you up for the video. That's okay. Good. The other That's side. Good. Perfect. Flip around the other side. There you go. Perfect. All good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so after after some of the the generalities of X-ray astronomy, I want to hone in on this one particular type of system and look at the look at the <clears throat> process that's really driving it. The process that we call accretion. And finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about the work that I'm doing to kind of unwrap the mysteries around these systems and to really look at what's going on in them because um, the current state of things is that we just don't know. We, we haven't figured out what these things are doing and why. Um, so X-ray astronomy, if you take a look at the Milky Way, this is probably some, a picture that you're reasonably familiar with. Um, but this picture is only actually taken in the optical portion of the spectrum. It's just visible light. Um, if you could keep your eyes open for long enough and go out and stare at the sky, you might see something um, that reasonably approximates this. We've got stars, um, and we've got clouds of gas, and uh, really all you're seeing is the, the, the true color image here. You're seeing light um, that hasn't really been modified in any way. Of course, this picture's been pieced together. I don't know exactly where this comes from. But it's all light in its, in its unprocessed form. Uh, but this is only a really narrow window of what's possible with light. When we look at visible light, you're only looking at a very, very narrow band of wavelengths or frequencies. Um, there's a lot out there, um, and not everything uh, necessarily radiates most of its light in the visible range. So what I'm interested in is X-ray astronomy, which is a form of high energy astronomy. Because really what we're talking about when we're talking about increasing the frequency of light and going from uh, the optical portion to UV or X-rays or gamma rays. So we're talking about increasing the energy that that light's carrying. So if you think about it, in order to produce higher energy light, you need higher energy phenomenon. So, so this to me, this type of phenomenon is the interesting stuff in astrophysics, the really energetic stuff, the really explosive stuff, the really dynamic stuff that's generating this kind of higher energy light. So I'm going to focus pretty much entirely on x-rays um, throughout the course of this talk. Um, to do x-ray astronomy, um, it's not the kind of thing you can do in your backyard, actually. And this is good for us, uh, because we don't want to be bombarded by x-rays from space. Um, you think about what happens when you're exposed to too much UV light and you've got, you've got a sunburn. Um, if you're exposed to too much x-rays or gamma rays, you've got cancer. Um, so this, it's, a, it's a good thing that our, our atmosphere is screening out all of this higher energy light for us. So this graph just kind of shows how opaque the atmosphere is, how good a job it does of blocking out different wavelengths of light. So you see, here's our visible portion of the spectrum. That does a pretty good job of getting through. We can observe that from the ground. There's a little bit of distortion, but it's not too bad. Um, the UV range is allowed mostly in, but when you go any higher energy than that, it's, it's blocked. We're out of luck if we want to observe that from the surface of the Earth. So what we do instead is we launch satellites to, to do the observing for us. And once you're above the atmosphere, observing X-ray sources from within our galaxy and from outside of our galaxy is no longer a problem. That light's not filtered. So if you take this picture that I showed you before the Milky Way and you translate it into X-ray, X-rays, um, look at it only in the X-ray band, what does it look like? Looks like that. So 
This is an image that was actually taken by ROSAT, which was a, a German satellite that launched in the 90s. Um, and it did an all sky survey. What you probably notice first, mm -hmm. what people always notice first, is that black tear on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. um, that is not a region in the universe where there's no X ray emission. Uh, that's mm -hmm. actually just a, a portion of the time that the satellite was scanning, it wasn't able to capture anything. Uh, so there's just missing data there. That's all that is. Um, it's not something Thank coming goodness. through from the universe. <laughs> yeah. um, but what you're seeing here is just the intensity colors for the, um, the the brightness of the x-ray source. So the, the whiter stuff that you see is brighter x-rays and the darker stuff is, is dimmer. Um, and if you kind of compare the two and you go back and forth, you notice that there are a few things that you can see in the x-ray picture that you cannot see in the visible. Most notably, this really, really luminous source here, some of these. Um, so we're, we're seeing a different class of objects. Some of these occur very, very close to stars that we know very well and that we've mapped. Um, some of them occur on their own, um, but what we're seeing are different things. Here's another view of Andromeda, um, and this is actually a very, very recent picture that was taken by New Star, which uh, I believe was launched in the past couple of years. It's an X-ray satellite. We had um, Shirsten Perez, and who was the, uh, uh, the PI? Uh, Chuck. Uh, oh, Chuck cool. Haley. Yeah, Haley was up here too. So we. Yeah, we're, we're, we know that so we know, know the new star. star. Yeah, Good, excellent. Star. So, so uh, what this is, this is Andromeda in the ultraviolet down here, and this puzzle piece that you've seen uh, that's been cut out, it's shown again up here, but in the x-ray. And again, you see all of these little dots and blips, which may or may not correspond to stars that we'll see emitting in the ultraviolet. So what, what are these things? Um, in a lot of cases, they're dead stars. Uh, they're stars that have reached the end of their lifetime, um, exploded and left behind these remnants. So the, there are different ways that stars can die. Um, I want to focus on one particular remnant of, of dead star, and that's neutron stars. So to make a neutron star, what do you need to do? Um, you, you don't just take any old star and just let it die. That doesn't always guarantee that you've got one. Um, our sun will not become a neutron star. It's just not massive enough. But if you take something that's about eight or 10-ish, solar masses, eight to 10 times the mass of our sun and let it die, what'll happen is that as it grows and it burns up the nuclear fuel in its core and expands, eventually uh, when it runs out of fuel and it stops that nuclear burning process, its gravity is sufficient to pull all of those layers back towards the center. And what you get is a lot of material falling into a very, very tiny space and it will explode outward again in the supernova. <clears throat> um, what's left then um, after the supernova has blown itself up at the center is a very, very, very compressed form of matter called a neutron star. Or if you have an even more massive star, you can result in a black hole. Um, but really, the way to think about a neutron star is just to think of it as neutron soup. You no longer have atoms in a neutron star. You've compressed all of those atoms together. You've forced electrons into protons to make neutrons, so that you've got essentially just one giant atomic nucleus. Um, so it's a really kind of rare and exotic form of matter. It's like nothing that we've ever seen or will ever encounter on Earth or nearby even, thankfully. Um, but they're, they're just fascinating objects. Uh, one of the most interesting things about them is that they're very, very tiny. So if you could take a neutron star and <clears throat> have it hover over Manhattan, you'd find that its diameter is about 10 kilometers, about the length of the island of Manhattan. Now, it's not just that it's tiny, it's also that it's massive. You've got about the mass of a sun or a sun and a half compressed into this very, very, very tiny space. So that combination of tiny and massive is going to be one of the things um, that, I, that I bring back and dig up again later on today um, because it's one of the unique properties of neutron stars that, that results in some pretty interesting behavior. So if they're so tiny, how do we know they exist? Uh, they must be bright. They are bright. Um, they're very, very bright um, in the X-ray portion of the spectrum. So here is here's Puppis A. Puppis made an appearance, an appearance a little bit earlier today, and so it's back. That's why I only saw that. Um, this is a supernova remnant in, at Puppis A, and this <coughs> image that you're seeing is again from Rosat, um, where the intensity of the X-rays is uh, scaled with the the brightness of this graph. So again, white, really bright X-rays red, very soft. Um, and you see that this, this is all a supernova remnant. This is what happens after a supernova explodes. It takes most of the material from that star and just scatters it out in this shell. Um, and this, these can be light years across. These are enormous. But 
towards the center, you see this very, very bright X-ray spot. And that's the neutron star. It's hot enough that it's radiating in the X-ray portion of the spectrum. Hotter you get something, the higher energy light it'll radiate. Um, you can watch this if you ever heat a piece of metal as it cycles through the visible spectrum as it heats up and emits different colors of light. If you can heat it up um, extremely, extremely hot, we're thinking like tens of thousands of Kelvin, you'd see something like this. Here's another picture from another supernova remnant, IC443. Um, this is actually a composite image. This is light that's been taken from the X-ray portion of the spectrum, as well as the optical and the radio. So the green is X-rays, uh, the blue is radio, and the red is optical, and we've layered them all together. But if you look down towards the bottom of this, again, you see a very, very, very strong X-ray source. So even though th these things are extremely tiny, they're radiating so strongly that we can, in a lot of cases, directly observe them. So one of the things that can change the way a neutron star radiates X-rays um, is its neighbor. So most neutron stars don't live alone. <coughs> um, most stars actually don't live alone. About two-thirds of the stars in our galaxy have a companion, um, and the, these binary stars will orbit each other, as we know. Um, when one of those stars dies, it leaves behind a remnant. If it's massive enough, it'll leave behind a neutron star. Now, if the supernova doesn't blow the binary apart, which can happen, uh, that neutron star is going to remain in orbit with its companion star. And I guess I should label this. There's the neutron star in this artist rendition. Uh, we call this the donor star because what you see going on in this picture is there's actually gas coming from the donor star and falling onto the neutron star. It's that neutron star's gravity that's capturing the gas. Um, and there are a couple of different ways that this can happen, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, this is a really, really interesting problem for astrophysicists to solve. Uh, because the dynamics of this gas flow are not simple at all. For the longest time, we've, we've approximated them in very simple ways, but now we're just starting to understand exactly how gas moves from one star to the other. Um, what, what happens as gas hits that neutron star is that it adds to the brightness of the x-rays that are emitted by the neutron star. Um, it adds a little bit of energy, and we see that x-ray source, uh, the neutron star, get a little bit brighter. So more gas flow means a brighter neutron star. And again, this is a really interesting problem for astrophysicists like myself, because what I'm interested in is not only how does the gas flow work, but how does that increased X-ray luminosity affect the rest of the system? It can actually interact with the gas flow. It can, it can keep it at bay through radiation pressure. It can ionize it and change, um, change the, the visual signature that we see. It can even irradiate the donor star and change the radiation coming from that star itself. So there's lots of interesting interaction between these two things. So I'm interested in a particular class of X-ray binaries. I kind of I cast a wide net over, over X-ray binaries in my work, but there's one class of system, one subclass of system that I'm particularly interested in, and that's supergiant fast X-ray transients. Um, I want to break that down term by term by term, um, so that you're aware of what each of these means. Um, really, each of these words is just a way for us to distinguish these systems from all the other X-ray binaries that are in the, in the binary zoo. Uh, there are lots of ways to build a binary star system. This is just one particular way to do it. So the supergiant just is referring to the donor star. Um, they're usually O or B-type stars, meaning they're roughly 30 times the mass of our sun. So you see our sun, just an ordinary low-mass G star down there. Um, these are much more immense. They're hotter, they're brighter, uh, and they're usually on the bluish end of the spectrum. Uh, they're fast. There's a lot buried in this term. Um, I showed you before, way back when, that there's mass flow. And I said that in that gas flow, in that mass transfer, um, you can change the brightness of the neutron star. In these systems, supergiant fast X-ray transients, um, the brightness of the neutron star changes so dramatically uh, that it's unlike anything we've ever seen before. So I'm giving this exclamation points because this is so insane, what I'm about to show you. Um, this may not look insane on its own, but it, it is, trust me. Um, so what we're looking at is the X-ray luminosity, the X-ray output from a particular SFXT. And this is its name. It's more like a phone number, IGRJ17544-2619. Uh, and you see that here we're just plotting the X-ray flux. 
and it has some weird units. Those are millicrabs, uh, because we compare <laughs> the flux to the crab nebula. Uh, so that's kind of used as a benchmark. That's all that that's. Millicrabs. Millicrabs, yeah. So normally, <coughs> uh, in its quiescent state, it's not emitting much. It's, uh, it's very low levels of x-ray luminosity, but then all of a sudden, it peaks, <coughs> it spikes, uh, and it's becoming anywhere from 1,000 to 100,000 times brighter. Um, that's a lot. 100,000 times is insane. There's, that's a, such a dramatic increase of energy. Something really, really dramatic has to be going on within that system to get it to jump so highly. Um, what's even crazier, or more explanation points, is that it happens on a very, very short time scale. Uh, when we study other X-ray binaries, sometimes we see gradual increases of X-ray luminosity. They get brighter and softer. Um, some of those are linked to, to the orbit. Uh, but here it's happening, it's happening on a time scale of minutes or hours, which, I mean, so again, something extreme has to be happening in the system to cause it to happen that fast. Um, after that initial flare, you see that it, it kind of dies off more slowly. It's got an exponential decay, um, and that's characteristic of these flares as well. But the, it's not so much the, the peak luminosity of the flare as it is the change in luminosity, 1,000 to 100,000 times as bright. Can't put enough exclamation points on the slide. <laughs> um, again, they are X-ray emitters. We observe them. Uh, we observe the X-ray output from these systems. We do it with satellites like Integral or Swift. Um, as majestic as these artist renditions of these satellites look, um, these are off the, the satellites' websites, their official sites. Um, they're really run out of buildings like this. Uh, this is the Swift Missions Operation uh, Center in at uh, Penn State, State College, Pennsylvania. Um, I work with a number of collaborators who, who work there, who are observers. Um, and it's really just an unremarkable office building. You'd drive by it and, and not think twice. But there's some amazing science going on inside. OK, finally, uh, these are transient. Um, these are not <coughs> predictable flares. Um, they aren't linked to the orbit in a way that systems such as this one, uh, XO2030375, again, real exciting name on that one. Um, in, in systems like this, you'll get periodic flares, usually because um, the flaring is linked to some sort of orbit, orbital characteristic of the system. So maybe the orbit's not circular, it's elliptical. So you'll have the neutron star getting closer and further away from its companion with time. Um, whenever it gets close enough, it might be able to capture more material from the donor, and you'd see a flare corresponding to, to that portion of the orbit. Um, that's not the case with SFXTs. Um, there is, there's kind of a loose link between the orbit and between the flaring activity in some systems, but it's not a guarantee. If there's one thing about SFXTs that we're learning, it's that no two behave in exactly the same way, and anytime you try to find a pattern in one, there's always an exception. And again, we know about 15 of these systems, um, and it's debated whether all 15 are actually um, they actually fit all these parameters that we, that we use to define them as FS, SFXTs. So um, it's really hard to nail these guys down. They're all unique, um, but they do share these, these <coughs> traits. Uh, again, the, the question that we're interested in here is why do they flare this way? We, we don't really have any clear idea at the moment, although we've got some good guesses. Um, if there's one thing that we do know, it's that it has to be linked to the way that mass is transferred from the donor to the neutron star. Um, so I want to get a little bit more specific about how this happens. Um, and this is the process that we call accretion. So in astrophysics, um, accretion is just, accretion occurs anytime you have some sort of body gathering mass through gravity. Um, so I can actually, I can give you an accretion demo right now. I can take my keys and drop them. <laughs> and I've just allowed the Earth to accrete my keys. <laughs> not, again, not super exciting, but uh, the same idea as accretion onto a neutron star, in that things that fall have energy of motion. Um, so as these keys fell from my hand to the floor, they sped up. They acquired energy of motion, and then when they struck the ground, they had to do something with that energy. They lost it. Um, in this case, that energy was converted into sound. It was used to deform the keys and make them jingle around a little bit. Um, but we did something with that energy. We got something out. Um, when gas falls onto a neutron star, what we're doing is not creating sound, but we're creating light. 
we're using that energy to heat the gas up as it falls. And as it does that, it'll begin to radiate at very extreme temperatures. Um, you can also, because this gas is not always just an ordinary ideal gas, sometimes it's a plasma, uh, when you stop a charged gas very, very abruptly, it'll emit radiation as well. So we see that happening too. If you think about what's, where that energy of motion is coming from, it's really gravity. Um, so this is, this is a way for us to get energy out of gravity. Um, take gas that's on this companion star, allow it to fall onto the neutron star, and change all of that energy into light. Um, accretion is actually the, the most efficient way to get energy out of mass in the universe. Um, if you compare it to uh, nuclear fusion inside the sun, you can get five to ten times the amount of energy out of the same amount of mass with accretion than you can uh, with that fusion process. So, um, very, very good way to release energy. That's what these systems are doing. So if we want to maximize the amount of energy that we release, there are a couple things we can do. Um, my example wasn't very exciting because I didn't release a lot of energy. If these things had exploded as they hit the floor, then you all would have wow, but they didn't. So what kind of change to make this more exciting? Well, I could drop the keys onto something massive. I could go to Jupiter and do the same experiment, and the keys would be falling much faster by the time they hit the surface because Jupiter's more massive. It's, got a, it's pulling down with a stronger gravitational force. Um, I could also allow them to fall on something small. Now, I want to distinguish massive from small. I don't mean small in mass. I mean small in size. So um, if the Earth, say, was had, a, had the same mass, but we shrunk it down to about half its size, um, when I drop the keys from the same distance from the center of the Earth, they'd fall for a lot longer before they hit the surface. They'd acquire more energy as they fell, and they'd release more energy when they hit. So this combination of very massive and very small is something that I brought up before. It's neutron stars, right? Um, so if we want really, really, really energetic, um, or we want re really, really massive quantities of energy uh, released by accretion, one of the best ways to do that is to allow, to allow stuff to fall onto a neutron star, because it's really only got a radius the size of Manhattan, but it's got a mass comparable to that of the sun. So the other object that kind of falls into this category is a black hole. And you can sometimes, um, you will see x-ray binaries that have black holes in a set of neutron stars as well. Um, so I want to revisit this picture again. This is the one that I showed you before. Again, we're allowing mass to fall from the donor star onto the neutron star to power the x-ray radiation. This is a really bad picture. This is just an artist's picture of what this might look like. And you see that it's whoever has come up with this has drawn just these tendrils of gas flowing from the donor onto the neutron star, and there's no real pattern, there's no real logic to how they're, how they're flowing. They're just, they're just flowing from one to the other. Um, I want to be a bit more specific now about how this accretion process happens. Um, there are a couple of ways that it can happen, um, a couple of broad categories that we, that we look at. One is through an accretion disk. So when you build uh, a binary system, things like how far these stars are separated from each other um, or how massive they are compared to each other can affect the way that gravitational forces act within the system. And if you build a binary system in just the right way, you can actually find a weak point in, gra in the gravity between the two stars. It's right on the axis between them. So that if this star, this donor star, expands it as it ages, um, that material on the outer layer of the star is going to become less and less bound to the star itself. If the star expands, this material is not held as strongly by gravity, and it'll, it'll start to drift. Where is it going to drift first? It's going to drift through this weak point, called the Lagrange point, the point where gravity kind of pauses. Mm -hmm. um, so as these stars orbit, material is going to be funneled through this gravitational <coughs> funnel towards the neutron star. Uh, the odds that it's going to fall directly onto the neutron star are very, very, very slim. Um, so what it'll do instead is that it will circle the neutron star. The neutron star's gravity will pull it in. And as it circles around, it'll start to build up into a disk. Now, as the stream continues to flow, what's going to happen is you'll get a denser, denser, denser gas in that disk. And you'll create friction within the disk itself. So essentially just molecules within that gas colliding with each other. Um, if you create friction by rubbing your hands together, you know that your hands heat up. Same thing's going on in this disk. As those gas molecules collide, they will heat up. The disk will begin to radiate. 
Um, and it'll also lose energy because what they're doing is they're, again, they're changing energy of motion into heat. Um, so they're losing energy of motion and uh, the gas will start to move gradually inward toward the neutron star. So what we're doing here is kind of moderated accretion. We're still allowing the material to fall onto the neutron star, but it's doing it more gradually. Nevertheless, all of that energy that it has when it's on the companion star, all that gravitational energy is eventually released. So because once you make a disk, it's pretty persistent, um, this is actually a, systems that exhibit uh, accretion disks are actually very, very steady X-ray sources. So we don't, we don't expect disks like this to form in SFXTs. Uh, because if, if they did, well, A, we'd be able to see some radiation from the disk itself, and we don't. B, we'd expect that the orbital parameters match the conditions that you need to get a gravitational funnel like this going, and they don't. Uh, and C, you'd see very, very steady X-ray output, and we don't. Instead, what we think is going on in SFXTs is wind accretion. So in a binary where wind accretion is happening, the stars are too far apart uh, so that you don't get this gravitational funneling effect like you do with an accretion disk and an accretion stream. Um, but when we're looking at very, very high mass stars like O and B supergiants, um, they're so luminous that they're actually blowing material out of their, um, out of their outer layers at, at pretty high rates. Um, it's really just luminosity from the star, light from the star that's pushing those outer layers away. It interacts with the atomic lines in that, in that material and just drives it outward. Yeah. So it's like the solar wind, but on a much larger scale? It's exactly like the solar wind, but on a much, much larger scale. Um, well, I don't know if you have line pressure in the solar wind. I would have to go look that up again. I don't think much about the sun. I like these guys. Um, so what you, what you um, see here is also an artist's rendition as well. And this, is again, isn't a very good one. Um, because they've drawn the neutron star way too big, uh, way too close, and they've put little magnetic field lines around it. Um, that's all that that is. Sometimes uh, you will get a magnetically charged neutron star, which is actually proving to be quite a problem um, for me and my work. Um, more about that at the very end, but that's what they're indicating here with these, these curved lines around the neutron star. What I do like about this picture is that they've drawn the wind in a way that makes it non-uniform. So it's clumpy, it's got holes, it's very dense here, but it's not very dense there. Um, and based on theoretical models, that's what we'd expect here. Okay, so this might be the answer to what's going on in SFXTs. So we know that this isn't the case. We think that this is probably the case. What about wind accretion is gonna allow that kind of extreme flaring that we see in these systems? Um, to do that, we can look back in history over 75 years ago um, to theoretical models of wind accretion to see what kind of predictions that they make. Um, Hoyle, Fred Hoyle and um, Ari Littleton created this model actually as a way to explain climate change back in the 30s um, because they thought that if the sun uh, was accreting material from the interstellar medium, it could cause it to heat up a little bit and burn a little bit brighter. They thought that m that might have a link to uh, the temperature here on Earth. Um, this model was a total failure. It has nothing to do with climate change, but we've repurposed it and we use it in wind accretion all the time. Um, it's kind of the benchmark for describing how we, how we, um, how much of an effect we expect wind accretion to have on the brightness of the neutron star. So I won't, I won't go through all the details, but I can certainly hang around and do that if you'd like. Um, really what they're doing here is they're, they're creating a model that you can write on a chalkboard and they're doing some pretty simple math to figure out if we know how dense the wind is, how fast it's moving, um, how dense it is and, and how fast it's moving, and we allow it to fall into the neutron star at supersonic speeds, how much of the wind do we expect to be captured? Um, the big result from this model is that, something that we kind of already knew, uh, it's that the luminosity of the neutron star, the amount of x-rays that it puts out, its x-ray brightness, is linked to the rate at which material falls onto the neutron star. Um, but more specifically, they, allow, they give you an equation that you can put numbers into. You can say, how, uh, very specifically, how dense the wind is, how fast it's moving. You can get a prediction out for how bright the X-ray source is gonna be. Um, that's pretty huge, and that's usually why astrophysicists are using this model, even today. Um, I have a few problems with uh, why we, or, with the fact that they're using this model, um, which I hope are gonna become clear in just a minute. 
Um, but this is really, really simple. And it's sometimes comforting to go to a simple answer like this. It's, it's not always right. Um, so how can we use this model to try to describe what's going on with SFXTs and really try to pick apart why, why they're flaring? It has to be related to accretion, right? It has to be something about the wind accretion um, that's causing them to flare. We can't do it with that Hoyle-Littleton model. Uh, it's just too simple. That model doesn't really predict any flaring at all. Um, so part of the work that I do, um, I'm a theorist, but I'm also kind of a computational astrophysicist, which is about as close to experiment as you can get in astro. Um, you can't actually do experiments, uh, but we can run models and tweak parameters and see how they affect systems that way. Um, so the, the work that I do is writing computational fluid models to model accretion, uh, particularly wind accretion, although I've, I've done other models as well, um, with streams like you've seen in accretion disks. Um, but what I do is I run these codes on, on supercomputers, like Kraken at Oak Ridge, which unfortunately now is, has been decommissioned and no longer lives, um, and Stampede, which is the one I use right now at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. So um, what we try to do is get really, really high fidelity models of wind accretion going. That requires really high resolutions, lots of processing power, and lots of storage space, which you, you can't really do on this. Although this little guy can dial into both of these guys, so I'm this, this is really the workhorse behind all of the, the stuff I'm about to show you. Um, so what do we find when we simulate wind accretion? Let's take that very simple Hoyle-Littleton Hoyle model and put it into a fluid dynamics simulation and simulate it with some more advanced physics. What do we see? Um, the video I'm about to show you is the results from a simulation that were done in two dimensions. Um, we often do two-dimensional models, which are essentially, they take place on a flat surface as a way to gauge what's going on in the system and to get a better feel for, for the dynamics of that system before we invest a lot of time and computing power in a 3D model. Um, so when we test this out in 2D, here's what we see. Um, this video was actually put together, it was edited by a guy um, at the Visualization Center, forget it, one of the supercomputing instances. Um, Institutes and he misspelled Littleton. So it's supposed to be a Y. But what you'll see first will be our computational grid. There it is. Um, what we're really doing is we're taking space and we're slicing it up into very, very tiny zones. And in each one of those zones, we're specifying the density the s and the speed and the pressure and the temperature of the gas. And then we put our neutron star at the center. So you can make those clumpy if you want? You can make them clumpy, yep. Um, so there's, this is not going to be a clumpy wind to start out with. Uh, it's just going to be totally smooth, just like Hoyle and Littleton would predict. So we'll zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see the neutron star. There it is. Um, I want to say a few words about why this looks the way it looks. First, the, the color is coded to the pressure in the gas. Um, so you see that upstream on the right, which is where the wind is coming from, flowing right to left. It's very, very smooth. It's very uniform. Um, <coughs> down here, what you see is actually a shock wave because the gravity of the neutron star is pulling that wind toward it. Um, and because it's supersonic, it's, it's causing it to shock as it does that. So that convergence is causing an increase in pressure. So this is kind of like if you fired a bullet through air, you have the bullet moving very, very fast through the air and you'd see a shock, or like a supersonic jet. Um, only here, we've got the wind moving rather than the neutron star. Although in reality, both move. That white stripe is rather interesting too. Yeah, it gets even crazier when we, when we let it play. So the yeah. first thing that you notice is that there's some wobble <coughs> in the shock. And this isn't what you'd expect if everything's uniform upstream, if everything's very smooth. Um, so this is spontaneous. This is just happening on its own, um, which is giving us an indication that the system's unstable. A little deviation from the norm can cause it to swing back and forth. And if you keep on watching it, it eventually swings so far that it snaps into a disc. Hmm. It turns wow. into an accretion disc. Yeah, it does turn into an accretion disc. Yeah. So it's actually, it's, it's different than the accretion discs you'd expect from a stream. It's not as dense, it's not as stable. And you see it kind of spiraling around. You've got spiral shock waves that are funneling material onto the neutron star faster than you'd normally see with a disc. Um, but it's definitely a disc. And it's definitely disc-like behavior. Was this predicted? It wasn't at all. Yeah, nope. This is really unusual. Um, so these are tracer particles so that you can see most of the material in the wind upstream isn't even accreted. It's either trapped in the disk or it's blown downstream. 
So that prediction, oh, I gotta stop, something wild just happened. Um, that prediction of Hoyle and Littleton that most of the mass upstream will be captured isn't true. Uh, the disk shuts off accretion. Uh, what you're about to see happen is the disk collapse. Right as these particles come in, um, the disk will disappear. So watch the direction it's spinning right now. It's going counterclockwise. Eventually it becomes unstable and it collapses, but then it's going to reform. It's going to spin the other way. So we call this the flip-flop instability. This happens again and again and again. The disk will spin, collapse, start spinning again in the other direction, collapse, start spinning again in the other direction. What is the time um, period on that? Um, this time, these are, these are totally arbitrary theorist units. Um, but we do see this on the order of, we would expect if we scaled it to normal units to be on the order of days. So, wow. yeah, yeah this is weird. very, very fast. So this was totally unexpected. Um, if we compare this to the Hoyle-Littleton theory, remember that that's predicting more mass accreted, brighter X-ray source. Here what we're doing when we form the disk is we're shutting off the accretion. So we'd expect it to get a little bit dimmer. But the cool thing is that when that disk accretes, you're getting a lot of accretion in a very short amount of time, which means you're kind of setting yourself up for conditions that might mirror what we see in a flare. You trap all this material out here, and then you allow it in all at once. So you make accretion very low, and then make it very bright, and allow it to fall. Um, so the assumptions underneath this Hoyle-Littleton model are a couple of things that we, that we don't see happening in this simulation. First is that neutron stars are vacuum cleaners, um, and that any amount of gas that's in the upstream flow to a reasonable limit is going to be accreted. And that was one of the things in their theoretical model that they just took for granted. Everything within a certain region is going to accrete. And that's not the case. You saw all those tracer particles flying off and spinning around and being blown away. Um, when that disk is forming, only about a tenth of the mass is actually accreted. So we've dropped it by an order of magnitude. Uh, the other assumption in the Hoyle-Littleton model is the gas won't spin. Um, they assume no angular momentum at all upstream, which means that no spinning occurs in their model and um, no disk-like behavior can form. <coughs> so now the real test is to go and take this model which was a two-dimensional model, and see if we see the same thing in 3D. Um, when I ran this model, we had no idea what to expect, because um, no one had ever done this before in 3D. It was initially simulated in the 80s and 90s with kind of low-resolution simulations. This we did in 2009 with a uh, higher-resolution 2D grid. Um, and then in 2010, I bumped it up to a 3D grid. Here's what we see. No flip-flop behavior, no spinning, Everything's almost exactly like Hoyle and Littleton predicted it, which was not what I wanted to see. Um, I wanted crazy things happening when we got the, the most steady, most stable simulation that we could get. Um, so here in 3D, what you're seeing, you're seeing a shock wave out in front of the neutron star, and that's just because when you allow gas to converge in 3D, you build up more pressure faster because there's more gas converging. So it'll shock before it hits the neutron star as opposed to a tail, and we expect that. Um, but behind the shock, I've got two cross sections in, at 90 degree angles to one another. And if you look at the structure, oops, um, they're extremely similar. And if you watch them evolve over time, the reason I haven't put a movie in here is because it just looks like this. There's a little bit of wobbling going on, but it's not that exciting to look at. So it's very steady and it's very stable. So if we know SFXTs are wind accretors, we expect behavior like we saw in 2D. We'd expect really dynamic behavior, and we don't see that. So if there are wind accretors that are in the actual universe, which is a 3D universe, there's got to be something else going on in addition to just this uniform upstream flow. So Dan, you kind of alluded to what's going on when you pointed out the clumpiness, the lack of clumpiness in the 2D simulation. Um, what if we put clumps, which we know occur in stellar winds, into a 3D <coughs> simulation? What do we see? So that could be one explanation. Maybe the clumps are providing enough additional mass when they hit the neutron star to cause a flare. Seems pretty straightforward. Um, this cartoon is taken from a journal article done by some theorists um, in Italy. Um, this was the actual figure that they used in their paper to describe their um, analytical model, which they just do with equations. So here's their supergiant. They've got clumps of various shapes and sizes hitting the neutron star, and they're going to predict how much luminosity you can expect. Um, 
when I read this paper, I thought we can do better than this. We can do better than the figure that they created, because this is clearly just a Microsoft Paint thing. Um, <laughs> we can do better than the analytical model, too, because we can put this into our computational model and see what happens in real time. Um, so here's my version. Uh, I've got, again, the neutron star at the center. Uh, you can see that clump upstream that's about to hit. I'm just watching one clump hit here because I want to see one flare. And the colors, I don't know how the well the colors are coming up, but red is, is low density, yellow is medium density, and blue, like the clump, is very high density. So what I'm doing here is I'm feeding the neutron star a lot of mass, and I'm hoping to see a flare come out. This is what happens. We let it run. It's going to go wild. That, that clump gets shredded. It's starting to see an accretion disk. Yeah, there's You can see some forward. swirling. Yep, it swirls one way, it swirls the other way. But eventually it just goes back to steady state. And it continues. So here's another view looking downstream. Same exact simulation. But here you can really see how complex the flow gets as that clump gets torn apart. Is this a this 3D is, simulation? This is 3D, yeah. So this is something that you'd never see in an analytical model. We just can't capture this type of complexity and this type of flow. Well, there's too much going on. Um, at the end, we're really only interested in how much of the clump is accreted and how fast it's accreted, which are pretty straightforward numbers. Um, but you can't take into account the complex fluid flow with an analytical model. We really need computational stuff to do this. So the real test, does it make a flare? Well, you be the judge. Um, this is the X-ray luminosity as calculated from the simulation over time. Here's the baseline accretion rate. There's the flare. It's about two and a half times brighter. Um, not a thousand. Not a, not a, not even close to a hundred thousand. Two and a half. Um, this is kind of disappointing. It seems like such a simple explanation. You hit it with the clump, it flares. The end. It's not the way it happens. What you do see, though, that's interesting, uh, is that the accretion drops when you get that swirling behavior. So just like when you have a disc, it turns accretion off. Um, here, any sort of rotation will suppress accretion. So maybe if we can change the parameters of the clump a little bit, we could get that accretion level to drop very low, and then the flare would become bigger in comparison. Because we're really only looking at the difference between these two when we look at the flare luminosity. So no, not really no flare. Um, another explanation could be that maybe a clump could induce the formation of a stable disk or a quasi-stable disk that would then collapse and give us a more dramatic flare. Um, so this is a snapshot to show that we can make disks by smacking neutron stars with clumps. So this, in this case, it was a direct hit. Where um, in the last one, you saw the neutron star. Oh, I'll go back. Uh, you saw the neutron star kind of miss and graze. I'm sorry. You saw the clump graze the neutron star. Here it was a direct hit, and here it caused a disk. But if we look at the flare, um, here's the initial impact. Again, it's only about 12-ish times as bright. That's actually not the most interesting part of this to me. What I want to look at when I'm looking at this graph is what happens after the disk collapses. Because we've already shown in, in case one that the neutron star alone won't flare um, when it's hit by a clump. But what if the clump causes a disk, the disk spins and then collapses? At the end of that, do we see a flare? And even here, no, not even close. So here I got the luminosity like before. This, I'm, I'm putting this in quotes as the, the spin of the disk. What I'm really measuring is the angular momentum of the disk. I'm just counting up how much and how fast every little piece is spinning and totaling that. So here's zero. Above this is clockwise. Below this is counterclockwise. Um, so after that initial impact, you definitely see some spinning. You definitely see a disk. But rather than collapsing all at once and producing a burst, you see a very gradual collapse and no flare at all. The accretion just goes back to its baseline level. So again, this is, this is pretty disappointing. But it's also kind of interesting um, because all of these very simple, straightforward, logical explanations for flares in SFXTs are failing. Um, so we really have to go back to the drawing board here. Um, this is where we're at in the state of SFXT research. Uh, clumps don't seem to do it. Um, other kind of contrived explanations don't seem to do it. Um, some people are looking at very unique stars, which will have stellar winds that are very, very dense at, along one plane. And they say when the neutron star travels through that, maybe it'll burst. 
Well, that's not true in all SFXTs, only one or two. So they, it, as a rule, it can't be causing these flares. Um, but one of the things that might be playing a role is the magnetic field of the neutron star. So when I mentioned the magnetic field on that one image that you saw before, I said it was going to come back at the very end to haunt us, and here it is. Um, the reason I kind of feel a little pale when I think about neutron star magnetic fields is because magnetofluid dynamics is one of the hardest problems to solve in physics. And we're just, just getting to um, the point in time where we can actually run codes that do this. Um, a lot of the codes are still working on ironing out kinks. They're not necessarily trustworthy. Um, and they don't have a lot of the, the kind of tweaks that we make in our fluid code, which is a pure fluid code, uh, to model these systems well. So it's going to, if we were to simulate magnetic fields with, uh, with a fluid model, it would require a total overhaul of all the code that we use, which is never something you want to do. Um, as far as theoretical models go, um, they have come up, one group has come up with a mathematical model to describe this. They say that it explains um, flares reasonably well, but it's, in my opinion, needlessly complex, because what it's doing is it's looking at what I'm showing you here, five different states of the magnetic field, five different ways you can set up a magnetic field some of which halt accretion, act like a gate, some of which allow accretion. And they claim that it's the transition between these states that's causing the flares. A very, very fast transition from a gate to no gate, which will allow material to flow in. The reason this is a hard problem um, to do computationally is that uh, it involves modeling very, very accurately the flow close to the surface of the neutron star and far, far upstream. And it's a real computational challenge to model things on that scale. Um, and to, be, to really run a high fidelity simulation across those scales, very small and very large at the same time. That's the kind of computer power that we, we I don't even know if we could get there yet if we tried. So we're still working towards this. Um, but this, every time we think we've got these systems figured out, we don't, uh, which is both exciting and also a little bit frustrating. But this is, this is the way of all science. Um, so there's a lot we don't understand about accretion. Um, that Hoyle Littleton model that I showed you, the really simple Blackboard 1939 version, um, that's actually used all across astrophysics today. Um, and theorists are very reluctant to give that up. So um, kind of one of the, the things I've been hoping to do with this work is to change their minds and to say, look at how complex this behavior actually is. This equation doesn't simulate this well. Um, we've got to move away from using this. Uh, there's still a lot we don't understand about accretion. It all hinges on the complexities of fluid flow. So my hope is that um, as we continue to work with this, we'll, we'll point out enough differences between the math and the computational models, and they'll all win. But it's an ongoing fight. So to really solve this, uh, we've got a lot of physics to do, and we've got a lot of computer programming to do as well. Okay, that's nice. what I've got. So the uh, neutron star, it's not sucking the life out of the, uh, the primary star. It's just uh, feeding off of the natural solar wind that's uh, being thrown at it. Right. Yeah, in wind accretion, yes. Um, in, the case of, in the case of an accretion disk with an accretion stream, um, it actually is the gravity of the neutron star that's pulling that off. But um, yeah, in wind accretion, it's just capturing wind that would be blown off otherwise. Do flares account for all of the energy that's obtained by accretion, by the accretion, or, um, or is there some of it still maintained within the Some of it's still, yeah, it's about, I'm trying to think of the number, I think there's actually 10% efficiency. If you look at all of the gravitational energy versus what's, what's put out as x-rays, it's about 10%, which is still pretty good as things go. You get, what, a few percent in nuclear fusion, so 10 is good. Uh, there's a question in the back. I think I heard you say that most physicists today still use the Littleton model. They do. And earlier you said that it's been proven to be a failure. If that's the case, why do physicists continue to use it? It's a good rule of thumb. It's a good order of magnitude estimate. So a lot of the times you, you just simply can't account for the complexities of the fluid flow, particularly in analytical models, which are essentially just differential equations that they'll solve to get an answer out. Um, it's a good estimate. Um, it's a good estimate of the baseline behavior 
when there's no deviation from a totally symmetric, totally uniform wind. So like you saw in the 3D simulation picture, uh, it, it actually does, that, that 3D simulation actually does follow the, the Hoyle-Littleton model pretty well. It's, it's about 70% of a Hoyle-Littleton estimate. Um, so in, in very ideal cases, it's not a bad approximation. I think a lot of the reason people cling to it is just because it's easy and because most of the time they're not totally concerned with, um, or in the case of, of steady accretion, it's a good approximation. Um, it's when we start to deviate from the steady accretion and we see things like flaring that it, that it breaks down. Yep. Thank you. I, I was wondering, what is the significance of the uh, Mach effect out in space in whatever that fluid is in there? Uh, under those conditions, like you know, it's, it's nothing like what it's uh, on the Earth, right? Um, or, or is it? Uh, it's really. I mean, the the primary consequence of the gas being supersonic is that you'll see a shock wave, um, and that's something that will have a signature that we can observe in. I'm trying to think of a band that it that it radiates in. It's in the optical or the UV. It actually exists can, out in outer space. It does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's actually the wind will become shocked um, because it's traveling so fast. Yeah, these winds travel at about a thousand, between a thousand and ten thousand kilometers per second. So, I oh, that that's that's the range, a thousand. Yeah. Like on the Earth, it's about a thousand or a little less. Yep. But out there, it could be uh, as much as ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what we do, yeah. So what we do is we compare it to the sound speed in space, which will different. It, it'll be a little bit different than the conditions for the sound speed on Earth. Um, but it's the same sort of analysis and the same sort of math that we used to describe it. And, and there would be some kind of a sound emitted there. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say there would be sound. Although you can see, you can see acoustic waves through the wind itself and through the gas. And actually, one of the one of the things that we think might be driving instabilities um, in these three D simulations when we do see them deviating um, is acoustic waves that are propagate between the neutron star and the shock wave. So you can get sound waves. I, I don't like using the word sound waves because it gives the illusion, or it gives the impression that there's sound in space. But yeah, it's vibrations Vibration. in the gas that'll propagate back and forth. Um, so that was one explanation for, for why we might be seeing that wobbling in the two. <laughs> Longitudinal transverse or just random? Uh, Hard to say. I haven't, yeah. I haven't done the analysis, so I, I can't say. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the clumps. Right. How much time does it take the clumps to move from the donor star to the uh, neutron star? <clears throat> um, they travel at about the, the same speed as the as the wind does. They're a little bit slower, but they're they're on the same order of magnitude. Okay, so given so. the size of the system, mm -hmm. how many hours? How many hours from days? from <coughs> from photosphere to neutron star? Yeah. Let's see. What do we expect the separation to be? Sorry. Because I do theory, I'm bad at memorizing facts. I, I work things out on, on, an as, on a need to know basis. So I'm trying to think about the separation between the two. Maybe before you go on, let me, let me tell you why I'm asking. Sure. I'm asking because I'm, I'm trying to, what I'm getting at is, is to understand how the radiation from the neutron star could modify the clump before it gets there. Ah, good question, good question. Um, yeah, so it's, it's on the order of hours, I would say, to make the transit, um, hours or less. So you're asking, could, could a clump that powers a neutron star flare affect an incoming clump? Could, 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 yes, could the radiation from the neutron star change the clump in some way? Could it like uh, alter its uh, density? Could it cause? Yeah, yeah I can see that. it could actually blow it apart. Um, and that's one of the things that I've been, been thinking about doing in the future. Um, until we hit all these wrinkles with actually reproducing the flare, that was going to be the next step, was to introduce um, X-ray ionization code into our fluid model. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I you, could, you would definitely ionize it, but you could introduce enough energy into that clump to just kind of evaporate it. So it's sort of imagine, too, you could also yeah. like have like all the helium pushed to the back, you know, with the, you could differentiate the, uh, by atomic weight. That's yeah, that would be interesting. I don't know that there's enough helium that that would make a difference. Um, what what is, could, what is the what is the what is the matter? What is I mean? You you've got a superstar giant star. Aren't you going through layers? You are. Yeah. So this is almost you're entirely changing, hydrogen. You're changing what atoms you're right. you're stripping off. Yeah. And eventually, in that system that you're looking at, mm -hmm. you're going to have a black hole. 
because you um, look at a super super giant star and you're looking at the neutron star combining it. Yeah? Right. That's pretty big. That's going to create a black hole eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But you're going to get down to you know super giant. You're going to get down to iron, right? I mean, you're going to you're going to change whatever you're stripping off by a lot. Start so, with hydrogen and helium and get down to. Mm -hmm. So so we we only really see the this the dramatic mass loss happen with. In the earlier phases, we don't we don't expect heavier elements to be blown away in that wind to to as strong a degree as hydrogen is. So it's oh, for really the purposes of our model, it's, it's it's all hydrogen. It's all hydrogen. Yeah. Um, Even though it's a super giant star, which has mm -hmm. a lot of other heavier elements. Yep, it does. But yeah, that's that's an approximation that we're willing to make. Mostly, um, I mean, it's such a such a large percentage hydrogen that we're we're willing to throw that out. I don't. What, to think if what kind of time scales are we looking at for that binary system to exist before it merges into a black hole? Are we talking about millions of years? <coughs> yeah, the accretion rate's so low. It's, it's so not. Low. It's yeah. not. Um, it's not like the case of a Type One A supernova where you're feeding a white dwarf material from a stream and eventually building that up and, yeah. to exceed the Chandra seeker mm -hmm. limit. That's um, the the rates of capture from wind accretion are three or four orders of magnitude lower than you'd expect from a stream. So it's it's a very slow process to gain mass from wind accretion. But I, I would imagine that when we were talking before about how none of these systems are, are identical, mm -hmm. that all kinds of little differences from the donor star in terms of how fast it's throwing off material, um, maybe minor chemical variations in the material, all kinds mm -hmm. of things would influence how the uniqueness of that system, how it's working. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that um, the primary factors that are going to influence the way that the X-ray flares are produced are going to be the binary separation, which will be linked to the period, and the mass ratio between the two, so how big the, the star is. I don't think the subtle chemical differences are enough to make a difference in the amount of energy that's transferred in accretion. But the, uh, the amount of, of mass being thrown off to link the size or strength oh, of the wind? Oh, strength of the stellar wind. Yeah, there is some variation in stellar wind parameters, yep. Um, and we've kind of homogenized those all for the purposes of these models. But what we can do is we can scale our model parameters to any particular system um, so that it approximates the rate at which mass is traveling um, in that wind reasonably well. So it's something we can tune. Can a neutron yeah. star magnetic field flip like it does in, in Earth? Um, not to my knowledge. I think. Yeah, there's, there's no, there's no geodynamo going on in uh, I mean, it flipped. Oh, my God, you know? What would that do? Yeah, we can... I'm trying to think of... You can have... You can have variation in the field strength, and that's that's beyond the realm of my expertise, because I, uh, as I said, I'm mostly into the fluid dynamics these days. But what, what's interesting about these systems is that this magnetic model that they've got requires a very strong magnetic field. But, end of the 12, 14 Gauss. And we've only got a couple of measurements of how strong uh, the magnetic field actually is in, in the SFXTs that we've observed. Um, and we one of them has a strong magnetic, magnetic field, one does not. No um, so I'm not totally sold on the idea of the magnetic gating mechanism because a lot of these systems don't necessarily even have magnetic fields that are strong enough to do it. So yeah. We'll keep you here forever. Let's do one more question here. Go ahead. No, okay. Oh, okay. You said you found, you found like 15 of these systems thus far. Do mm -hmm. you think that these are relatively rare or that it's just like kind of us? That we um, pretty rare. I think they're pretty rare. Yeah, I think the, the conditions have to be right for these to occur. Uh, part of the reason we haven't found them is because they're hard to detect. Sure. Um, because in order to see a flare, normally what you'll see is them in their quiescent state where they're not very luminous at all or where there's an intermediate level of luminosity. But to catch a flare, what you have to do is you have to have the telescope see it in a very, very small window of time. So on the SWIFT, they've got a detector called the BAT, the Burst Array Telescope, which will, will have a very wide array view of the sky of a particular region of the sky at once. And if it sees an increase in X-ray luminosity, it'll, it'll alert the telescope itself to swivel and watch this thing, because it's about to go off. Um, so we have to really be lucky in when we catch these things flaring. And once we identify them, then we know to watch them in the future. But it's... I'm sure there are more out there uh, than 15. I think we, we know about 300 galactic X-ray binary sources. Um, so 15 is a it's a small percent, but now that we know what to look for, we can we can try to capture more. Would oh, I guess I guess one last question: Would these be visible in another galaxy too? Um, I don't see why too not. far away. They're they're bright enough that they could be. Yeah, I think they're just easier to spot within our own.
-hmm. It's harder to classify them. I mean, we can we can get a real good look at their optical counterparts for the donor stars here. Um, that's tougher to do in a, in a galaxy. Definitely. All right, if you have more questions, show me around for a little bit, but let's get for Eric. Um, 